We've been together as long as I remember, Ratata and I. We bonded instantly when he was presented to me on my birthday. Summer spent frolicking and winter spent with snowball fights. Before either of us knew it, we were old enough to begin training. Neither of us really knew what that meant. My gym teacher just paired us off with the students one day. He read out a bunch of laws and rules before yelling out, fight. I watched in horror as my classmate ordered his spear to begin mauling my ratata under the improving glare of our instructor. Malice flickered in the eyes of a child I had considered my friend. With each attack, he congratulated his Pokemon on the savagery inflicted. When I could take the grizzly scene no more, I forfeited the fight, earning a failing grade in the process. That was when I realized. The other trainers didn't care for Pokemon the way I did. They thought nothing of sending them into the arenas, for mere fighting and amusement, their sharp, pitiless hunger for fame and fortune driving them to commit the worst kind of atrocities remembered by the history books. This is why we do it. This is what strengthened our resolve. There were enough fools wandering around, getting their fix for mindless violence, that posing as one was easy enough. Ask one to duel and they will agree readily, a vacant smile hiding in their bloodlust. Only when Ratata attacks them directly do they comprehend the pain that they have been causing and inflicting. As his claws slice their flesh, they gain a gift of understanding. While they are excellent learners, I credit Ratata for being an excellent teacher, always eager to spend a little extra time for the required lessons. But no matter how many people we educate on the nature of violence, there will always be people willing to engage in the depravity against Pokemon. The void is never empty for long. Evil finds a way to flourish. Our only consolation is that, even if it takes a lifetime to fulfill our mission, there is nowhere else we'd rather be than by each other's sides. It was a difficult task, but someone had to do it. We couldn't use shortcuts, we couldn't afford explosives, Pokemon would refuse to help, so it had to be done with handheld tools. The demolition of Pokemon Tower, that is. I had no hand in making the decision, and even if I quit the job it would have happened anyway. I needed the money, I was a poor man from Cinnabar. The volcano that made the island in the first place had erupted violently, and buried the town in its heavy ashes. It buried my home. Though neither my wife nor my kids were hurt, I had to raise money to rebuild the house, and my old job as a janitor was gone, ten feet under solidified lava. So, when the news went out that workers were needed to demolish the Pokemon Tower, I obliged. Using our family's lone Pokemon, my starter. Firo, to fly out to Lavender. The small rustic town wasn't as out of place as people made it out to be. It was just barren, and I guess the building of Kanto's very own radio tower, instead of tuning into Johto stations, was a good idea and would bring business to the town. Anyway, I'm rambling. And it's hard to think of what 20 workers and I were doing. The Pokemon Tower had been standing longer than any of us had been alive. I'd been there one time before when I was young, to bring an old friend to rest. I wasn't a very good trainer, and, um, I ended up releasing all my Pokemon shortly after the incident with Golduck. He was my purpose for my original visit to the Pokemon Tower. But, but enough about him. It's hard enough being here, doing this, already. The work was nitty-gritty. The task was to completely hollow it out, floor by floor, and disassemble the frame in the same way, and we had to do this from the top down. You're probably wondering about the many graves. Most were empty, to my relief. Only words in the tombstones were left as memories. But some weren't. As we had to remove each and every casket from their place in the floorboards, they had to be opened. As the tower hadn't been open for the public for almost half a year now, none of the corpses were fresh, and frankly, we didn't know what to do with them. I tried not to look, of course, but sometimes I, I just couldn't help it. I would have rather gotten a direct stun spore in my eyes than see some of those bodies. 
One I remember was a seal, rotten, flesh red and black and had merely a skull, dried red filling the bottom of the grave, and the smell, oh the smell. I almost left after bearing witness to the first decay Pokemon, especially when I knew we descended from the seventh floor to the fourth, my partner Gold Duck would be there. I would be disturbing his rest, disturbing his peace, his soul. Why did I ever take this job? I didn't even like the idea of tearing down the Regis' largest cemetery. Every one of these Pokemon had a story, a trainer, a life at one point. And all they wanted was to rest. The work took a long time, sun up to sun down, for many days. I lost count after a while. Staying in the diminutive hotel really wasn't helping, and I couldn't get a healthy amount of sleep. It wasn't long before I completely resented taking this job. The relatively high pay wasn't enough to make up for the moral crimes us workers were committing. I wasn't the only upset one about the tower. I guess we all needed the money. I told myself that it was going to be worth it. It was going to help my family. As I screwed my eyes shut and emptied the wheelbarrow into the dump. Debris of wood and stone among various rotten Pokemon bodies. When we had worked down to the fourth floor, I tried to stay away from the southern end. I wanted someone else to have to deal with the bones of my past. The rotten sounds that came from nowhere as we slowly, painfully gouged out the tower. Most were soft Pokemon sounds. A warble or a growl or a sob. But some were almost human-like. As I came upon a grave marked with a small spoon, I feared, correctly, for the worst when I pulled out the nails from the floor to reveal the decomposed, shriveled Alakazam. Most of the bodies were smaller Pokemon, Rattata, Nidoran, or Sandshrew. There were several here. They were the easiest to just look away and take care of, since they were small animals. But Pokemon like Meowth and Growlithe both of which were also heart-wrenchingly common, pulled a certain string in our hearts. But Alakazam, the body? It could have been mistaken for a human. And the flash of hot fear I felt almost made my lunge come up without warning. I had to take a breather, so I left the site for a few minutes. The image of the curled-up psychic type had scarred me. I would never forget it. And I couldn't forget the inevitable either that the body would be dumped in among with the rest of the junk. I forced my mind to stop wandering when I imagined what could have killed such a strong Pokemon. After my heart rate had returned to normal, I made my way back up to the fourth floor. The stairs were murder on my legs, to come face to face with the image of a crying Golduck. I jumped and yelled out, almost taking a dangerous stumble backwards down the stairs. The image was gone. The sound of my departed Pokemon remained echoing throughout the tower. I grinned and muttered a pitiful excuse when one man looked over at me. As I turned away though, I saw a Vulpix floating behind the closest man's head. Its eyes were blank with misery. I made the connection with Dread as behind another one was a Pikachu, a War Turtle, and an Electabuzz. I could only guess that Golduck was behind me too though no one else seemed to see them as I carted out empty grave by empty grave. Without gaining a hold of my sense of direction, I picked up my shovel, my hammer, and went back up to an untouched grave. Words weren't illegible. I heard the protest of a gold duck behind me as my heart dropped to my chest. I couldn't stop the downswing of my arms. The wood covering gave, weakened by rot, and broke inward to reveal a skeleton of him. It was many years ago that the Golduck had been taken away from this world. After my adventurous companion disregarded his weakness to electric types while he explored an abandoned power plant, drew many trainers. Being the clumsy but well-meaning Pokemon he was, Golduck had burst out of his ball eager to battle when he bumped into a sleeping electrode. The angry Pokemon cornered him against one of the many broken down generators, and before I could recall him, or at least send out Golem to back him up, I... 
The electrode had released such a loud, superconducted thunder attack that I had fallen back and bruised myself. Without pausing, the electrode fired another one. Through the limp form underneath the suddenly supercharged generator, it was already sizzling. The electrode rolled away without care. It was a harsh blow of confidence as a trainer. It was harrowing. Not being able to recall him, having to make my pharaoh carry him to the Pokemon Center, where he was proclaimed gone. And I had to walk by foot to Lavender that same day. And now, here I was, an adult, and I'd fallen to my knees with heavy gasps for air between sobs, longing for remorse. The disarming sound caused the rest of the workers to look, most of them accompanied by one of their own lost partners hovering above them. They were silent. Though their own disheveled eyes held much pity, they understood. I lost myself for a short while, in my tears for Golduck. He was the second Pokemon I'd owned. He was... He was my best friend. Then he was gone so fast and so easy. It just seemed wrong. And I was tearing up at the resting place of other people's best friends. It was horrible. Digging out their bodies and piling them with trash. Tearing up their peace. The hit my heart took was a deep one. And after my eyes could cry no more, I left the Pokemon Tower for the last time. Destroying the building was wrong. The spirits would have every right to rise against us. Golduck had every right to get me. I pleaded for forgiveness. I bared my heart to him. His presence slowly dissipated. The Pokemon Tower was still being torn down. Eventually, I never got paid. My family was moved in with an old friend. We're doing okay. I told my wife what happened there, and she said she couldn't blame me, and I could never bear to ever get a radio, or anything that associated with that place. I could never visit Lavender Town again. It was a few years later, actually, when um, one of the co-workers that stuck around ran into me while I was getting groceries. I recognized him, along with the Vulpix who he'd been following. He had told me that he'd gotten a radio, and all he ever heard on it was the sound of his light Pokemon, Vulpix, calling for him. Though his own family only heard radio broadcasts. He said the same thing happened to the other workers, the ones who had also lost Pokemon in their lifetimes. We had never fought against the new radio tower, because the pleas of a small group of men could never overtake the drone of an entire region of people uninvolved. Our people even found a peace and forgiveness after time. They stopped hearing the mournful cries of their Pokemon on the radios. But the rest of people across Kano, whose Pokemon had been buried and then dug up, desecrated, if they ever left their radio on late enough and listened hard enough, they could hear the pained protesting and growling, the sobs and the wails of their poor departed Pokemon with restless souls. I was creating a video to dispel the rumors about Lavender Town, and ironically, I discovered a secret way between the end of the town and the Pokemart that was camouflaged. I was bouncing off walls trying to figure my way through it until the end, then I found this clear defined path that led to a cave.
When I went inside, it was foggy. Very foggy. This sort of set me off, so I tried to leave the cave, but I just kept bouncing off the wall. When I tried to reset the emulator, it didn't allow me to do that either. The cave was narrow and long, and the fog was fairly thick too. I continued down the path till I found a sign, and started reading. It was written in Latin, so what I did was is I put it into Google Translate. The English translation is, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Son of the morning, you've been shot, nations dominating the land. For thou hast said in thine heart, I shall go up to heaven, above the stars of God. I will lift up my throne and sit upon the mount, meeting in the far north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and be the most high. I'm pretty sure that's gospel text or something along that line. When I finished deciphering, I continued down the road. And in the end, there was a sprite of a man dressed in black. I started talking with him, and he said something in Latin, and then in English. It was just something as simple as, I want your soul, and then a very slow ellipses, as if it cost him to speak the language. A battle then began. The traitor was named Belial. It was the sprite of a goat-headed man, described as the devil. In his team, he had six Pokemon, but I only got to see the first. It was too strong. It was a Houndoom at level 100. My team was weak. I, I didn't stand a chance. When I inevitably lost, there was no message saying that I would go to the nearest Pokemon Center. When I didn't spawn back at the Pokemon Center, I felt shivers down my spine. I suddenly turned pale. I, I felt sick. My game froze and I had to restart it, but I was able to go back to a Pokemon Center afterwards. I tried to go to the cave again to face Belial, but when I reached the road, it was blocked by rocks. And like the first time, the exit was blocked, so I was locked in the cave. I didn't have any escape ropes or digs, so I was stuck. So I restarted the game with the attempt to not walk in the cave, but the game file had been erased. I had to start again. I can't really explain what happened. Just be careful. It has come to my belief that there's more to the Lavender Town in this game than meets the eye. Have you heard about Officer Jenny? Not a lot of people have in general. There's just something off about her. Imagine it. You're a rookie trainer and you come to your first big town. You've caught a few Pokemon, won and lost a few battles, but you got a bright, promising future ahead of you. Then you meet her. She won't do anything strange or suspicious. Not at first, at least. Maybe she'll be walking in the street on a patrol or investigating some minor crime. It's always a minor one, you see. When was the last time we ever had a major crime? Murder, or a kidnapping, or arson? Well, there's a reason for that, but we'll get to that later. Let's focus on our police officer for now. So you're walking into town for the first time and you see her looking right at you. Maybe the two of you walk by. She seems friendly enough, if a bit focused, but you can't shake the feeling that she isn't much looking at you, is looking through you. You're a piece of meat. 
That's if you notice the feeling at all. She does her best to minimize this, though she can never get rid of it totally. What you're feeling is a natural reaction to seeing something pretending to be human. There is a scientific name for it, but to layman, it is when something is trying so hard to look like one of us that only the smallest, subtlest hints exist that it isn't so. That feeling you get, it's a warning. Your brain doesn't realize it, but your subconscious does. It wants to run, and you should never ever feel like that. If you do, you'll get her attention. If you're lucky, she won't choose you. She is picky. She doesn't select just everyone. Only one in a thousand are worth the risk. If you're lucky enough to be that one, you'll have more warnings before the end. First, you'll see her more and more, always doing something, always working away busily in the background. A lot of people develop a dislike for the color blue, which is what she most likes to wear. You can run now, but it really won't help. After all, there's a Jenny in every town worth the name. Really, at this point, the best you can do is just relax and let it overtake you. You'll never escape, and for the first few weeks, it will seem almost nice. The best thing that could even happen to you. You'll begin to dream of her, of Jenny. Just what dreams they consist of doesn't matter, only that they will bring great pleasure and fulfillment. You'll start to win more battles, everything will work more perfectly, it'll be like a dream come true. But that dream is about to turn into a nightmare. You'll become tired, simple tasks become much harder to do, and your memory will begin to go. You'll start to misremember things, or remember things that haven't even happened yet. We're not really sure why she does that, maybe it amuses her? Anyway, one day after the two to eight weeks, you'll see Jenny again, but this time, you'll see how she truly is. Just what she looks like under that disguise. No one who has seen it has survived. It's a sign, see? When you look at it, it means you're ready, and she knows instantly the second you see it. That'll be the last night of your life. She'll come in cloaked in shadows, no busy work to distract you this time. She's not hiding why she came here. Her face will look different. At first it's changed somewhat, but really hasn't. This is just the first time you've seen that look of hunger on a human face. Like a starving man presented with a fine meal. She can go years between feeding, so when she does get to eat, she likes to savor it. Jenny isn't really human, you see. She never was. She's a creature, a monster born of darkest nightmares. That's why there are so many of them. That's why there is one in every town. A long time ago, they agreed to help the police in the region, but they also demanded payment. Blood. No one will help you. No one will miss you. Even your own mother won't remember. That's her power. In the dark of the night, with no one around, you'll face her and she will drain you dry. All your hope, all your light, all your emotions, gone. If you're lucky, you'll wither away and die. There's nothing wrong with that. It'll be as your heart didn't want to keep beating. But if you're unlucky, you'll wake up. Not tomorrow, not in a week's time. The transformation takes a while. But when you do wake, you'll have power over those weaker than you. Which now includes most of mankind. You'll hunger for their hearts. Jenny will have punched and ragged a hole in your soul, which you can never fill. But you'll try. Oh, you will try. There are upsides too, though. You'll never age or grow sick. So long as you have a meal handy, you can heal from any wound. By meal, of course, I mean victim. That's okay, since you won't be able to think of them as anything but food. Your brain has been altered. You'll never see any human as anything more than food again. And others of your kind will always be enemies. It's a lowly existence. And pray for us all that you don't have any daughters. I think we all knew who they grew up into. So you see, Jenny's greatest victory isn't the feeding itself. It's the terror she inspires in her victim, and ultimately it is to make you like her. Luckily, this transformation happens once in a few hundred victims. Most of the time, they just die, and Jenny takes their body, with no one to remember them, no one to come looking for them. But a thought occurs to me. Do you know how I mentioned that we hardly have major crime anymore? Well, given that fact, we seem to have an unusually high amount of arrests. And how many people ever actually seen a prison? All I can say for sure is that I never have.
Have you ever wondered why in Generation 2, Gold, Silver, and Crystal, that there's only one place in the whole of Johto and Kanto that you can breed Pokemon? I can tell you why, but I warn you, you may not like what you hear. Especially if you feel particularly attuned to the suffering of animals in our own world. With that out of the way, I shall begin. A lot of emphasis was put on Team Rocket's little science experiment at the Lake of Rage, and soon after that their takeover of the Radio Tower. And all the while, they had already set up a much larger, but more secretive operation. You see, the daycare man and his wife were not the first to discover Pokemon had laid eggs. This was the first discovery of a lowly Rocket Grunt, who was in charge of looking after a captured Ditto. The Rocket Grunt Hiroshi thought to be the easiest job on the whole organization, not once had he run into an 11 year old child who had single handedly defeated Team Rocket not even a year ago. He was not respected enough to have his plans follow through though. So he's never messed up so badly that he'd have to come face to face with Giovanni and explain it himself. Hiroshi had it really easy. All he had to do was make sure that the Pokemon weren't too loud, that they generally were fed, on a rare occasion, if they soiled themselves, he would wipe it up with a rag. The Ditto were kept in a squaler. Hiroshi as regularly required to electrocute them if they were not silent. However, most nights, they remained silent, with only a sad humming song that resonated in the filthy hallway. Each cage, no more than 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, and electrified mesh wire held the two Dittos. The transformation pits also held two ditto, but they were 10 by 10 feet wide to accommodate for the shape-shifting of larger Pokemon. All controlled by electrical frequencies to what all controlled by electrical frequencies as to what Pokemon they became. They all sang, one after another, and the song spread outwards. Roshi felt his eyes begin to flutter. He felt compassion for the beasts, cramped in their cages or in the transformation pits. Besides, the song wasn't unpleasant to listen to, but falling asleep on guard was a surefire way for things to go wrong. To help keep him awake, he reached for a Pokeball. When the energy was released from the ball, Narcanine padded towards him, towards its master. If you smell anything out of place, or if they try to escape, use whatever force you think is necessary. Narcanine nodded, and its large head padded down to sit next to its master. With that, Hiroshi nodded his head, and almost instantly fell asleep. By a terrible squealing and panting, his eyes bolted open in a panic. He scanned the hallway, the cages, and the transformation pits. The song had died, and its place was a horrible screeching noise, as if the ditto began to panic at once. Hiroshi had only a split second to run to the lever and flip it down before several sparking bolts seared through the wires, causing a high squeal from the confined ditto before they knew to be silent once more. But still, the whimpering and hushed language continued between them as they shuddered in their cages. The panting continued. Hiroshi stepped slowly along the aisle, looking at each single cage. The ditto stared back at him with an expression of pure fear as they shook from cold and hunger. It was the first transformation pit that he found his Arcanine, panting. From under him was a transformed ditto, in the shape that Hiroshi did not recognize. It was dog-shaped, but was black with white horns, and its head and a long, whipping tail. The ditto dog panted helplessly under the Arcanine. The searing pain of a forced transformation to an unfamiliar shape confused and distressed it. Arcanine, having a long, loud yelp before demounting the ditto dog and paddling back towards Hiroshi, jumping with offensive ease. Hiroshi himself was still in shock after he watched the Pokemon shape in front of him. He had never seen anything like it before. The ditto shape looked sickly. Many of the bones were not internal and showed the outside dog-like body. It panted again before collapsing. Hiroshi shook its head and unsheared his Pokemon away. Such strange things were not uncommon to see in transformation pit dittos, sometimes with the different currents. The ditto changed shape into structures that only they had seen before. 
Excited by what concept of a new Pokemon, Team Rocket have tried desperately to get Ditto to stabilize into one of the new forms, but no avail. What disturbed Hiroshi, however, was the way that the Arcanine had simply mounted the poor creature. In the weeks that followed, Hiroshi took care not to release any of his Pokemon out of their balls when he was on his Ditto duty. He paid extra attention to the dark dog Ditto, who laid sprawled out in the floor of a pit, tongue lolling from its mouth, and its breathing extremely labored. Lack of food, water, and cleanliness making it look even worse than it had already. Hiroshi smirked a smile. You have the look of a doomed hound. The dog Ditto looked up and shakily stood on its four legs. What happened next astounded and scared Hiroshi for the rest of his days. The Ditto dog scrunched up his face and howled again, causing the caged Ditto to scream with terror. Hiroshi ran to one of the Poké Doctors, thinking it was a Ditto dying. Now that would be an offense to Giovanni. When they both had returned, the Ditto dog was still standing, howling inhumanely. A high-pitched squeal as its innards burst from its backside and fell into a bloody heap behind it, a large, solid mass among the awful debris. The doctor jumped onto his pen immediately, but the ditto dog had already begun to dissolve. First into a pinkish gelatinous goop, ditto had expired, but still left on the dirt of the pit was an awful and a large mass. The doctor stiffed through the awful to pick up the mass. To its surprise, it was steady in his hands, and held it up to Hiroshi. It was an egg. The egg was monitored for days on end by a scientist in Hiroshi, who took a personal interest in the big discovery, until all at once the news spread about the department and the egg was hatching. There was a big commotion at the department, as the people crowded at the small table. The egg began to snake and crack, little splinters coming from the pieces, and the dark had emerged. It was disgusting. It was gruesome. It looked evil, but it was new. A puppy, black as night with a skull seeming to be visible on its outside and its ribs protruding from its back. It was perfect. Hiroshi stepped forward, parting the crowd. His mind swimming with opportunities. If this Pokemon lived, thrived and reproduced, then he had successfully achieved, by accident, what the scientists had been trying to do with Dittos when they were captured. He had created a new Pokemon. Its mother, Ditto, was Houndoom. And its hound, Hound Hour. The scientists nodded in silent agreement, all astonished by the events that happened before them. From that moment onwards, Hiroshi was presented before Giovanni with the Hound Hour. And was promptly put in charge of the Ditto Evolution Project. For the next two years, Hiroshi studied the Ditto in the pits, forcing them into strange, grotesque shapes with the aid of electrical current, and then forcing them to breed with a male gender of a similar-looking Pokémon. He managed to do this successfully with at least a hundred different variations of Ditto. All of them managed to birth eggs. Some eggs never hatched. Some eggs hatched and then Pokémon died within a few days. Some eggs hatched and the offspring were infertile or never evolved. But there were many. There were many eggs that hatched just like Houndour and managed to successfully evolve and rebreed. After this was successful, they had tried many Pokemon they already knew. Pikachu Dittos had a strange Minichu baby. Magmar Dittos had these stranger Minimar babies. The discovery was outstanding, but tragic as none of these offspring lived after the mother Ditto had expired, which led to the development of better medical care and gradually the Ditto could sustain more than the offspring in their lifespan. But still, the babies did not thrive. This continued for many years until word of mouth began to travel, with wealthy Pokemon collectors sporting brand new types of Pokemon, the Ditto, their eggs, and their babies were all mysteriously released in one night. And Hiroshi was found dead in the labs, his body charred beyond recognition through visual means alone. Whatever this was, it was a revolt. Whether this was a revolt from the tortured Ditto, who just so happened to escape, or whether Pokemon activists managed to infiltrate and release the Pokemon themselves is unknown. It was several years afterwards when many of these species had begun to thrive in the regions of Johto and Kanto, that an old kook living outside Goldenrod came 
home to rather shocking discoveries. A large soft egg nestled between the two Pokemon they were looking after. Rocket continued the project, however, with whatever ditto they could find. Still to this day, they are trying to manipulate them. And with a bigger gene pool than ever before, there is no end to the mutations they can force.